you're alive. Hello, hello, everyone. Today we're going to talk about directing with this amazing director. This is Ever Nachikin. He is coming to us from Ashland, Oregon, where he is at Oregon Shakespeare Festival. I know Everin as an incredible director of plays, primarily from his work in the Bay Area, but he has worked all over the country. You are a theater creator of all things. And I'm so um, grateful that you're gonna spend some time talking to us about what you do and how you do it and how directors and playwrights work together. And yeah, how's it going? Uh, hello, Lauren. It's so good to see your face. Uh, yeah, I'm excited to be here. I can, you know, talk about new plays, playwrights, directors all day, every day. So it's sort yes. of very central to my passion and what I do and how I do it. So yeah. this is exciting. Yeah, thanks. Well, I, a little bit about kind of why we're doing this. I started teaching these classes or offering these chances to talk about playwriting, but it occurred to me that's such, um, that is one <laughs> corner of the pie that makes a new play. And mm -hmm. It is such a collaborative field as we know that it felt strange to not talk about directors, specifically from a director who like you has such a, a great and rich career with new work. Um, and I think it would be, why don't we just start at the beginning of how you came to be a director, how you specifically came to be a director of new work and kind of, yeah, what, what was that journey for you? Of course. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I've been doing theater my whole life, basically. I've, uh, my whole family are engineers and math people, including myself. I studied computer science and engineering in college. Um, and, uh, but like theater was just what I did. I was a hammy kid. So from like age four, um, I was doing school plays, other, you know, kid parts and some other professionally things um, in Turkey where I grew up. Um, and when I, I went to the school that was a uh, theater program was part of the ESL program, English as a second language. So really what's so weird is most of my theater career has been in English, although I was born and raised in Turkey. Mm -hmm. um, and there I was a good enough actor, I will say, like I was fine. Um, but uh, it became pretty clear pretty early that there were other people who were just much better at it than me. And part of it I realize now was actors need to have this like very narrow focus to be the really good ones have a sense of everything that's happening, but they're like looking ahead of themselves. So like, you know, like they're sort of looking here. And I was just like, you know, it's like light sound, just paying attention to all the wrong things. And it was my um, uh, directing the theater teacher in high school, senior year was like, I think you're a director, direct this play. And I did, and it was good. Like I was like, oh, okay. And then in college, I started doing it more and realized pretty quickly that like directing in rehearsal was the perfect place for me. Like that, mm -hmm. that's when I was like, oh, like I'm a designer, I'm a organized engineering mind and I've acted and I'm a story person. It all mm -hmm. kind of came together. So that's where I sort of clicked fully into my director self. Um, what brought me into the theater was the classics. I mean, I did a lot of Moliere. I loved uh, the Shakespeare was a huge part of my English learning. I love the Greeks. I love Lorca. I love, 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 you know, um, Tennessee Williams. I absolutely adore. So that's sort of what I thought I was going to be doing. And then I moved to San Francisco for an ex and um, San Francisco at that time, especially was a new place town. So the work that was available was in new place. So I sort of entered it as a like, well, this is the job that I can get. Um, and then I realized I was pretty good at it. And that was like an interesting realization of, um, I really do love collaboration. I think that's sort of the thing that I love and having another brain in the room that owns a certain part of the process and that we can both wrestle with it together, that there's another partner that I wrestle with, not everything has to come up to me to solve in a way. Um, it really got exciting. And then the thing that really clicked it in for me was Golden Thread Productions, which is the country's first theater company um, devoted to the Middle East. And I was on staff and a resident artist with them. And I still am a resident artist with them for about 15 years, where all of a sudden, there was sort of a mission driven aspect to the developing the new stories with playwrights because those stories were let's be honest like purposefully excluded from the mainstream mm -hmm. and 
having that space to be able to engage with my identity and to like put forth stories that had never been allowed to be told in this way before, um, that got really exciting. So it sort of started hitting my social justice activism side of my personality, which is such a big part of the why of theater for me. And getting those two things together, I think is what really clicked it where I was like, oh, I do love being a new play director, yeah. you know? Because I mean, collaboration, theater is collaborative if you're Anyways. doing Shakespeare. Yeah. And then to add such an immediate, urgent collaboration of a new play, which mm -hmm. as we've worked together, they're changing constantly. There are big ideas, every day brings a big idea. Some of those big mm -hmm. ideas are like, oh, that's a blocking change, let's fix that. And some are like, oh, that's a first act, let's rewrite the whole thing change. Yeah. <laughs> Um, which you, you don't usually get that with Shakespeare. Um, yeah. How do you describe the difference of working in, let's just a play where the a script where the play isn't changing, at mm -hmm. least because of the, the playwright and, mm -hmm. and a new play? I mean, I know there's a ton of them, but how do you kind of, what parts of your brain work or how does it, is it the same, mm -hmm. just more or yeah, yeah, what is it? I mean, it's kind of funny. Uh, uh, one of the reasons why I think that kind, the kind of process we had, right? Like the really crazy play is totally not written when you like start the process and then by opening you have a play, a version of the play that like feels like a complete play, right? Um, that That is super exciting, but it requires me to be, it's not just flexible, but you have to set up all the parameters around the collaborative process to be able mm -hmm. to move at any given moment. That is, most obviously in place for design, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm an essentialist director. I usually love sort of like, what can I remove from the stage so that there is just one central metaphor that I'm looking at. Um, you know, that is sort of my artistic impulse anyways. And with a new play, I usually am more often than not looking for a playground. So I'm not looking for like, perfectly, you know, like rotating set so it only can go one direction or, you know, like those really set ways in which we um, can and it can be super lovely and impressive to watch. Um, but I really stay away from those. It's usually like, here is a metaphor, you know, here's the context, the thing that holds the space together. And then I have a bunch of stuff in the space that I can move with actors. I can, so that I can respond to anything. So if you bring me a totally reordered act one, a week before tech, I can just restage that, right? right? Like I don't have to like talk to a million people about how the set now needs to move this way and the yeah. lights need to move, you know? So, yeah. um, and I can't tell, to be honest, for a long time, I thought this essentialist aesthetic for me was because I had no money to work with because I was working in small theaters and I was doing a ton of new plays. So there had to be a lot of flexibility. But now that I get to play with a bit more money for, making theater and also I'm not necessarily always doing new plays I still do the same thing mm -hmm. so it's just I, I can't tell which came first like it's just who I am and then it just happened to fit into the new play process or I just did so many small theater new plays that it's just who I became it's yeah. hard to say but that's sort of the ways in which I think about it the collaboratively what I find is it's kind of an interesting thing um I have sort of interesting thoughts about American playwriting where, where it's become such a scarce scarcity model. And it was basically like playwrights were doormats for a long time, right? Like it was just like, you can just ignore what they did and just make a play, right? It was a director's medium. And then in response to that, we've like all of the funding almost in the theater, like a lot of funding goes to playwrights now. There's sort of new plays and world premieres are really, uh, lifted and beloved and both funding wise and otherwise producing wise. But that has sort of within the scarcity model, especially of theater in general, it's made it so that um, American playwrights can become really obsessive and precious about the world premiere text, right? Oh, yeah. Or what they intended, right? So it can be very like, this is what I wrote, right? Rather than entering a collaboration as, what do you see here? Mm -hmm. Right. And then, of course, it's their words like I'm not, you know, <laughs> right. But right. like that there is a sort of I find my I'm finding myself recently like I'm thinking of Mono Monster, the re relationship we had with, mm. you know, you and Gita uh, for Gila. I'm thinking of Said Sarah Fizade. I'm thinking of many, many Jisan Choi that I just developed to play with at Playwrights Foundation. Um, I like writers who 
take you as a generative artist as well and take mm-hmm. me in the idea that like, I will show you what I, like as a director, different brain, right? I will show you what I'm seeing. I will move some things around in collaboration with you. And then you can say, no, that's not at all what I would like, right? Yeah, but yeah. it allowing for that um, give and take yeah. is something that I'm really looking for now, like as I choose collaborators. And this is not to say that's the only way a playwright should work. I just think this is more speaking to finding the right person for the right yeah. job, right? Like right that's what I'm, like that's when I do my best directing. So if you're not a playwright who enjoys that kind of interaction, there are a million other directors you should be working <laughs> yeah. with, you know? Like, so I think that's yeah. sort of a, a lot of what I'm thinking about these days as I consider building relationships with playwrights. And I'm also really interested in like long-term relationships with playwrights now that it's not like I'm hired to do the world premiere and I just come in and do it, but that Mm -hmm. like, what if I'm signed on? And this happened a couple of times with Mona, Mona Mansour, where I was brought on as the director before she wrote the play. Yeah. Right. So I was there from like, here's 10 horrible pages I just wrote. Can you read it to like, yeah. what the fuck is the ending, right? So it's just, um, I'm, I'm finding myself a lot more drawn to those kind of processes. And I think it's just where I am generatively as a director. But I think, I mean, similarly, it took me a long time to realize that those relationships are the ones that are going to generate the all the other things, the like, the canon, the thing that you're creating as an artist. Uh-huh. I mean, I, I it took me a while to realize that what I needed to be finding was was directors that got me, that got Mm -hmm. how I work, that got my sense of humor, that had Mm -hmm. the shorthand, that got the like, oh yeah, Lauren writes for everything to go fast until it's not. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we, Mm -hmm. like all of the the stuff about, and the why, as you're saying, the why of theater, finding Mm -hmm. people's whys that agree with your why of, I want to make something that engages the heart, that doesn't put the the conflict off stage that that really brings the the catharsis to the middle of the stage and I want it to be political and I want to talk about culture and I want to talk about identity and you know finding those the collaborations is I mean it's the name of the game in anything but I think in an yeah. earlier part of your the career not your mine all of ours we are more likely to kind of just say yes yeah, sure anything yes what can I do to get a, yeah. a job what can I do to get this thing and then as you get further on you're able to go what am I what do I do to find the people that make the best art my best art my mm-hmm. best self yeah. Um, and it's just so interesting, though. It's I totally hear you where, especially in the early part of the career, you're just like, yes, sure. OK, you want me to stand upside down and have 10 hula hoops and, you know, include Shakespeare? OK, fine. Elizabethan dress, whatever you want. I just need the job. <laughs> right. Um, and then you sort of I wish there was a way to learn without like messing up so much right like you sort of almost have to say yes. And it needs to be like a glorious failure. And then you're like, oh, never do that again right got it now (laughs) noted but i really hear you on the thing for me is i'm drawn to what i'm drawn to and it's really been interesting because i carry the producer director hats right and it's always really funny for me how like i'll read a play and i was like man i want to produce that play and i know the director for it versus like this is my fucking play and no director can touch you know what i mean like (laughs) it's just like that that instinct is really interesting and i'm i feel very lucky that i have those two hats that really for me work very well together um because there are writers that i adore that i'm not the right director for Mm -hmm. you know what i mean because i just don't get it and there's something about, I think you talked about rhythm. That's mm-hmm. really for me what it is. And a tonal thing, because I'm just, what I'm interested in, and some of this is cultural and some of this is who I am, is like, you know, that like, is it a tragedy? Is it a comedy? Right? Like you're like crying and then all of a sudden you're laughing and then you're crying again. What what happened? Right? Like that's that's where I am most comfortable. That That's mm-hmm. what comes to me really naturally. And almost like when a play is like cry, 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 yeah. I don't understand it. Like I yeah. deeply do not understand it. Not to say those plays aren't good. They're just not for me, right? Yeah. So I'm always looking for those things of like, I get this play. I know what this play is, right? Like I I, I can direct this play, yeah. even if it's unfinished, even if I have no idea what I'm going to do with it. Like there's something about this play that is inside of me and it's just like our rhythms are in sync. And um, 
yeah, and for me, like you, that's fast, 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 yeah. fast, 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 feel, feel, fast, fast, feel, feel, fast, 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 feel, feel, fast, fast, yeah, feel, exactly. <laughs> But it's actually kind of funny because I remember even for our collaboration, like the, the rhythm was really easy, I found. Uh, like I clearly got you and Gita's and Gita has a beautiful sort of off kilter humor yes. and like, cl- like I want to say clown, but it's not, that doesn't fully She's capture lie. it. She's like, yeah, but it's also like everything is just like weird. <laughs> like everything is twisted in a very intelligent, smart way. Yeah. Um, and that's also sort of where I live. So I was sort of a good match for both of you. But I remember like I had a lot of a hard time. I had a very hard time finding your ending mm-hmm. for that play, like in the performance. And I like tortured myself for it. And it was actually a very simple ending. Mm-hmm. Because I think you're usually like your endings, you're very committed to like delivering it, right? Like it like goes all sorts of places and then it comes together and it's just like not what I do or like at all. I'm usually like, I'm not finishing it. Fuck you, audience. You deal with that, right? And I remember I was like trying to find this ending and then we found it. It was a very simple solution, which was literally exactly what you wrote. Like once I actually did what you wrote, it worked. And I remember being like, oh, wow, this is so interesting. And every other collaborator in the room was like, yeah, that is what it's been from the beginning. I don't know why this was like, it was such a difficult play and all the insanity. I was like, I can figure this out. I can do this. And the really simple, very like well-made Lauren Gunderson ending, you know, really beautiful ending. I was like, I don't know what's happening in this scene, which was funny. But like, those are the kind of things that really excite me right? Like that, 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 that kind of dissonance sometimes how you can have as a director and a playwright together. It's fantastic. Like that's so fun. That is an interesting, weird thing to live through. And like, you know, the next time I do one of your plays and it's not, I'm not going to say like you do the same thing every single time because you clearly fucking don't, but like, it'll be easier, right? Like I will know that that's something that's inside of your creative juice. So I can yeah, well, but and See that's it. that's the whole thing. Oh, and I, as as most people know, who hello watches, Kitty, the cat will join us. My um, dog is sleeping right there. Oh, perfect. <laughs> um, uh, yes. So I, there is something that I I do think that is like the lesson again. Thinking about there's a lot of folks who are watching this are students uh-huh. of directing, writing, um, yeah. or are writers who are kind of discovering that they're writers or perhaps watching this, you're discovering, oh, wait, no, I'm a director. <laughs> um, that'd be fun. That'd be fun. Come to the dark side. Yes, there we go. So with that kind of perspective, thinking about what, without being like, what advice would you give to a young director? Um, but what advice would you give? What are the, what are the kind of the building blocks that you feel like you can generate on your own that like first job when you got to San Francisco how did you mm-hmm. do it how did you <laughs> how, how did you get there how did you yeah yeah like what's the practical kind of how do you talk to an artistic director do you pitch a play do you they yeah. pitch to you do you what it's is all, all the- depends you know it's just so funny uh my career path was really in interesting because I was an immigrant with no so, like sort of financial safety net. So the, the sort of assisting path, which a lot of directors take, was not possible for me. Mm. I had to have a full-time day job, right? Like that just, yeah. so I couldn't assist at ACT for no money. Yeah, right, right. That just was not possible. Um, now there's a lot more conversation about internships and assistantships, having some sort of finance, like, you know, uh, salary attached salary mm-hmm. might be too fine you know, fancy a word stipend. for what? <laughs> stipend there you go thank yeah. you that's the word um but at the time you know back in the day 15 years ago there wasn't it was just all free so i sort of had to cobble together my career which was a combination of saying yes to a bunch of stuff so i could be around right like running lights running sound painting the set, you know, like whatever. And I worked in a lot of smaller theaters because they were rehearsing in the evenings. And you did some Um, marketing too, isn't that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was my day job was marketing. And I was lucky enough that my day job sort of put me in side a theater. Right. And for a long time, for about 10 years, that was fantastic. And then I had to get out of the theater for day job because people couldn't, people have a really weird time in the theater where like, however they meet you, that's the only thing you can be. So if people were meeting me at the Magic or at ACT as a marketing person, they couldn't understand that I was also an artist. So I had to sort of do a big shift around 10 years into my career to be like, 
I don't do that for theater anymore. So that I only meet you as a director. I even had to do that. I was a set designer director and I actually had to like hide the set design credits from my resume because people weren't like, it was just hard for people for a while. Uh, Maybe the slashes are a little easier now. I mean, I'm certainly more interested as a producer, as a person who hires people in folks who have multiple skills, you know, Mm -hmm. that I think is just interesting. Um, In terms of the advice, like, I personally believe in doing it. I'm a terrible assistant. I don't actually learn a great deal in class um, unless it's a practical class. So I learned who I was by just doing it, putting up a bunch of plays with my friends in bars and art galleries. And look, you know, Golden Thread was a huge thing for me because they had this sort of mission that helped. Um, made me important to them in a certain way. So I was given opportunities by them before Mm. sometimes I was ready for them. You know, my very first real true directing gig came because I was at The Magic as a marketing associate at the time. And our education person had gotten a teaching gig, so had to drop a show. And it was two weeks before rehearsal started. And she was like, oh God, I have to drop this show and I don't know who can direct it. And I was like, me so there is certainly like uh, being in the right place at the right time and convincing people that you're competent Mm -hmm. because the hardest thing with directing is you don't have auditions and you don't have a manuscript you can give to someone who proves to you that you're good they need to sort of believe that you're good yeah you have to do it you have to do it or you have to in a coffee convince them that you can run a room um you know and that's very challenging um I come across competent, <laughs> I found early, you know what I mean? Like when I, I talk about what I do, people believe me, which is nice, even when I was younger. Um, but, you know, that was a big thing. Like just figuring out that coffee conversation is really weird. And um, coffee, you mean sitting down with an artistic director yeah. or, you no know, kind Never. of like- Playwright, you know, Hi. like, yeah. this is who I am. And I love your play because of this thing. And, mm-hmm. you know, these are the plays I'm interested in. In terms of the artistic director pitch sessions, it's so hard because each artistic director is totally different. Some people are already have their plays and are looking for a director. Some people are just trying to meet you and you won't even work for them for five years, but it's just a meeting. And some people are like, what do you have? And then you need to have the like, the thing I would say, the two things I would say about that is one, it's people relationships. So if you're not building a personal relationship in a pitch session, you're failing, mm. right? Like you, it's actually about meeting the person and they're actually, if you think about it, a producer who's meeting a director is like figuring out if they want you in their house for two months where mm-hmm. you're going to be in charge. Yeah. Like it's their house, right? So you're, you really have to like, like each other, trust each other. That pitch session is as much a, audition of them for you that's right you know what I mean it doesn't feel that way because they're the decision maker but like do it's you want to be in that too. house it's not it's like we're, are, we're going to be co-parenting if you're yeah, a playwright like, and a director like do you want it are you and we're going to like and it's going to be tech and we're going to yeah. hate each other like do I mm-hmm. this is great this is so lovely Lauren but like in three weeks when you're whatever although you're never late for your rewrite but like you know when you're like a week late for your rewrite and I have two days to tech, am I going to still like you? Like, you know, Mm -hmm. can we still work? You know, you sort of have to suss that out. Um, You know, so in that way, um, it's a complicated thing. And I never quite know how to answer to like, how do you build a career? How do you get that first job thing? The only other thing I would advise, and I had to learn this the hard way, is don't pretend, right? There's a sort of weird American idea of like, fake it till you make it right and i wouldn't recommend it because they Mm. can tell like usually faking it like Like pretending like you know how to do things you actually don't i see sure you know what i mean like the better version would be like i've never done this before but i make here's here's how i think i would do it like that and here are the ways in which my past experience has prepared me to do it right that's great right that's great advice yeah i mean that's how i that's worked for me you know yeah. what I mean? Because I find that every time I've pretended to be better, more experienced, mm-hmm. more whatever than I am, I don't get the job. 
Yeah. I mean, I'm, and maybe I'm just bad at pretending. Maybe there are other people who are better at pretending and they can, <laughs> but I found that that just doesn't work for me. Yeah, 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 yeah. So let's think about um, perhaps it's your relationship with Mona or mm -hmm. what are the things that you would encourage directors of new work to do before the, the first workshop? Like what are conversations you would say, you've got to have this conversation with your playwright or mm -hmm. how do you prepare for that workshop um, to kind of, again, trying to, to, to investigate and interrogate this collaborative nature. And some directors are like, you learn, you collaborate really when you're in the space. And some are, I feel like the ones that I flock to and, and the ones that I've had most success with are, mm -hmm. are kind of dramaturgically minded. Like we're having conversations about the script. Um, as, way before. Yeah. yeah, way before as and with the dramaturg. And mm -hmm. so how do you, what are your kind of like the, you know, first couple steps when you at the beginning of this new play process? I am really interested in the why, like, why are you writing this play in your mm -hmm. mind? You know what I mean? That might not be what's on the page. Like that's, you know, beside the point, but like the point of inspiration, what's the first thing you wrote? Mm. If I'm not there, you know, what was the first scene you wrote? Um, and it's a combination of things, depends on when you come into the process with new plays, I'm like always torn and I really follow the writer, right? Like Mona is a great example of someone who does a shit ton of research mm. and has read book after book after book after book before she writes almost, mm -hmm. right? Like it just kind of, and then it just simmers and then something comes out. Um, and I am careful to not, to, to figure out which one of those million things she read I should read. Yeah. Because right. there's something great about knowing the original source of whatever that inspiration is, but also there's some great value on not knowing that yeah. so that I can actually reflect back what she's written. That's so smart. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I am. If you both know I'm the same things, you are assuming yeah. the same things and you don't. Exactly. Like yeah. inside or outsider, which is, I think, a new play director's role very much is always like you want to be inside the play and you also want to be the person that's outside the play a little bit and holding the audience perspective. Oh, yeah. That's uh, smart. Does that make sense? You know, like how, what what is actually happening in this scene? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Like I I think this is what's happening in that scene. Is that what you want, yeah, <laughs> you know, right, like, right. And, and it's also, I do this with actors too. Like I'm, um, I always say this, I'm a statement director. Um, I make a lot of statements in the rehearsal room. And I think that's true for my playwright collaborations too. There are other directors and especially dramaturgs who are so good at asking questions, mm -hmm. like not leading real questions that spark real things. I'm not that person. And mm -hmm. every time I ask a question, I'm always worried it comes in condescending or leading rather mm -hmm. than like, so I ask questions, but that's when I'm like, I don't understand this question. So I will usually, even with actors go, what I saw was this. Like I will try to name the thing that is in my mind happening in the room. Mm -hmm. And then we can have a conversation from there. And the thing that works, and this is very much cultural, having been born and raised in Turkey, my assumption is that if I make a statement, strong statement, you will tell me you don't agree. And we will have a passionate hands moving conversation about the thing. And then yeah. we'll come to an agreement or at least an interesting non-agreement, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that can be, I have to be really careful about that and how I do it. And um, especially because now that, like I'm a tall white enough passing man um, with now graying hair you know, and now with a impressive position at a major theater company. So I'm very aware of the fact that when I make a statement in a room, it carry, comes with a certain kind of weight that mm -hmm. is not intended in my delivery, right? So I actually have to, I mean, I'm sure I've done it here. Like I do, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Am I making sense? Like I purposefully undercut my statements so that people know that I'm welcoming mm their opinion and that like this statement was made to provoke a conversation, not as God's right. word, you know, yeah. in the room, which as a director, you have to be careful. You do carry a certain kind of power in the room, 
especially with younger playwrights or something. Yeah. You know what I mean? Someone who has less experience but leading I think that room. Even this self-analysis to be able to to be able to articulate how you communicate is mm -hmm. invaluable, to, especially to a new relationship. Certainly yes, for yeah. directors and playwrights working on a premiere, the mm -hmm. idea of if we haven't worked together any clue of to how you actually say what you mean, how you actually mm -hmm. have the conversation is great because it is different. And certainly earlier in my career, I didn't, the way I was communicating and the way I was being communicated to were, weren't successful. And I kind of didn't mm. know until it was like opening night and you're like, oh, I needed to yell at you a little bit more. I see, yeah. you were only listening when I was mad or <laughs> whatever, you know. I, I avoid those relationships, but yeah, I more. totally hear you. Yeah, you. Uh, yeah, no, it's a, you know what's really interesting? I'm not a, I mean, as I like just talked about how I communicate, I'm also not a, this is how I work director mm -hmm. either, especially, and I think that's really important if you're a new plays director, right? You need to have a flexible enough process that you can work with different kinds of writers because writers, I mean, actually that's not true. Like you're a very social writer who, I think writers who come out of acting are their own specific breed. Sometimes I feel mm -hmm. like they know how to be in a rehearsal room. Yeah. They know how to speak to an actor in a way that actually pushes them forward. And then there are writers that like should never speak to actors. You know what I mean? Because they just Don't like, yeah, no, it's just like, it's not helpful because they're mm -hmm. not, what they're looking at when they're looking at the scene is so separate from what the actor is looking at. Right. I do have to play the mediator between the two. And there are certain writers, you know, Francis Yauchu Cowhig was a great example of this. And I loved collaborating with her. Mm -hmm. She didn't want to have the attention on her in the rehearsal mm -hmm. room. Her, she wanted to as invisibly as possible observe and then in very specific moments insert herself. But then again, like she didn't want to be in the room in the same way. She didn't feel comfortable with that. Uh, and that's personality, artistic choice, whatever it is. But and we, I was able to do that with her. And then in a way, she was seeing things in ways I couldn't because I was so in the middle of it. And yeah. she was just like this brilliant collaborator of mm -hmm. like reflecting back to me what I was doing yeah, in really right. beautiful, generous ways for a very personal play for her that we yeah. were working on. So you have to have different ways you make space in the room and you communicate in the room so that everyone is doing their best work, right? Like that's, mm -hmm. in my mind, the director's role is like you hold the space so everyone can succeed, including yeah. yourself. That's but, right. it, you know, it's interesting in the sense that I do better when the writer is forthcoming. I will say that. Mm -hmm. I like it when a writer says no <laughs> or like says, I'm not interested in that. You know what I mean? Sometimes yeah. Bay Area, especially I find, and in the American theater, there's this sort of fear of conflict, mm -hmm. right? Like this, like, oh God, if if I say I don't like what this person is doing, then I will never work with them again, like whatever. Like if the conversation is about the work and not me, right? It's yeah, what I'm doing, yeah, of course. who I am, right? Um, I, I, I would know rather- I don't like it, I'm happy to say it, but oftentimes I don't quite know what mm -hmm. what's not quite right, you know? But, but as this soon is as not I'm working like, is oh. helpful. Yes, that's right too. Yes, yeah, something- right? Like don't pretend like it's working and then be mad later. And right? Especially like, just, on a production because that top clock is ticking. Right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> We gotta figure it out, the floor opening. <laughs> yeah, but it's also, it's kind of funny now I'm like completely com going around in circles a little bit on the flip side. And as a director, you have an interesting internal clock to this and some writers do too, that like, that's gonna work in a week. Yes, right, right. Please don't rewrite that scene. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> right? And I've had to do that with a lot of writers because they're like, oh my God, this is terrible. I'm like, yes, it is. Because the actors don't know anything yet. Yes. Right? Yeah. And it will be okay. Like, it will be okay without me saying anything. And this right? is also where the longer term relationships yes. come. Yes, because yes, if yes. You, the first time you've worked with a director, then you don't know if it's just going to suck forever. <laughs> or if you're like, no, it's going to suck for now. And then... Ever it's a always process, it. It, you it, know. He, I trust him. If he's not worried, I'm not worried. <laughs> but it's also like, you know, like you all have to know, like the third week run through is going to suck. Oh, yeah. Right. Like, and in a way, I wonder if this is some part of the communication. I try to be 
especially when writers come in and out of the process, mm -hmm. which is a lot of times what ends up happening, um, you know, which works really well, actually, like a writer in the room every day is, I, I would assume, torturous for the writer while we're like just <laughs> often, yes, like doing horrible things to your play until we figure out what it is, you know, why would you want to sit through that in a way? Yes. Uh, but at the same time, when they're coming back, I think making that time before they are in the room to tell them where I think we are. Oh, that's really helpful. I like that idea. Right? Like, hey, Lauren, this actor is a mess right now. <laughs> I know he knows. Oh, that's great to know. I'll, I'll watch this you know what I mean? that <laughs> like, in mind. Like, you know what I mean? Like, we, yeah. we don't know what's happening. And if you have any ideas after you see it as to where we're off, like, that'd be super helpful. Great. Yes. But yes. like, this scene, I don't understand. So I really want you to, and I think it might be a writing thing, but I don't know. Can you look at that scene really carefully? Like, whatever that is, yeah, really setting really the, helpful. like, because it's just, now that I write too, actually, I, I know how overwhelming it is mm -hmm. when you're putting something in front of people. Yeah. So unless somebody helps you like go pay attention to this, mm -hmm. you're just, it's easy to be like, I don't know what's wrong. It's all wrong. Yeah. <laughs> what it wrong? My husband always you know? jokes that like <clears throat> the uh, right after tech is when I'm like, nope, it's over. No one's to see this play. Just cancel, cancel opening. Don't, don't do anything. Yeah, He's exactly. Like, Every single play you say that I'm like, nope, it's real this time. It's real. <laughs> it's real this time. Yeah. I have a similar, um, uh, my husband was like, is it helpful when I remind you that this is what you do? I'm like, no, <laughs> it's no. not because I like, I always who... do that. Too. I was like, no, no, no. This one this is, is the true this. bad one. <laughs> I will never work again this time. It's like you say that literally every the play. The true bad one. <laughs> <laughs> like this yeah. is uh, there's this is unsavable, and it's like this no, I think it's four days before tech. It's it's four days before tech. Come on, <laughs> I know. No, no, you don't understand. Yes, I yeah. think that openness is is a great idea, and I do want to talk about your writing as well. I will say <laughs> one thing that I learned earlier in my career was to have the conversation with the director as early as possible about what any number of ways to describe the same moment, which is what is the point of the play? What is the climactic moment? What is the gesture mm. that we're waiting for the entire play? So that as long as we both agree on that and we can say, yes, it's the hug, it's his apology, mm -hmm. it's the stabbing, it's the whatever, mm -hmm. then we can go, great. All the things we're working on together, whether it's one actor or all of them or this moment or that transition are, are pointing towards the same thing, then it's like, then we're going to be okay. It's when mm. those things are misaligned that you go, oh, I didn't realize that you didn't realize this was a love story. You thought it was a mm. political drama? Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> They can yeah. be both, but we need to both be on the page that they are both and not one or the yes, other. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, no, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, I totally agree when when a writer is that clear it's super helpful but it's also like sometimes the best writing can come out of they don't know either they know mm -hmm. their play like in their bones they know something about the play that is something I can't even imagine you know what I mean different brains again like there's some and I do love working with those writers where they're like embody what the play is about in a way but they if you ask them what it's about they couldn't quite say mm -hmm. and i love like that is a i think those kind of relationships can be super helpful too because my way of working of like this is what i'm seeing is that it is, this is what i'm seeing can be incredibly helpful in yeah. that kind of relationship so it's again like that's like my nightmare I, to not know where i'm going <laughs> yeah so exactly is, which is like you know but a, 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 a relationship is, is awesome. And I do yeah. think it's, you're totally right to say a writer that can't say, I don't know, is, a, that's a good, not a good relationship either. Because that's if a I great just come thing. in with there all the go. answers, then to have somebody go, well, where's your climax? And you can either make it up and as you're fake it, so you make it kind of thing. Like that's never going to end up being helpful. Mm -hmm. But the, one of the biggest thing I learned was to say clearly what you do know and mm -hmm. also be the first to say, I do not know. That Any ideas? <laughs> you know? Yes. Who's, or that who's like the we best will idea know. in the room? <laughs> you know, or yes, we, will we will know. know. You know what I mean? Yeah. This under this belief that you can and it's it's all gut, you know, like that's the funny mm -hmm. thing for it. That took the longest time for me to like come to terms mm -hmm. with career wise was 
I'm good at figuring it out when it needs to be figured out. And if I force myself to figure that out earlier because this actor or this writer or this producer just will not let it be, I will come up with a worse version of the actual solution. Like I'm good at solutions, so I'll find something, but... Yeah, that's so interesting. You know what I mean? Like sometimes being like, can everybody just do this scene with conviction for the next week? Like it's working. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's terrible. Like this is not working. (laughs) But can we just keep doing it this way until one of us has an actual aha moment? Mm -hmm. Rather than like the Band-Aid and let's just cut it. Let's rewrite it. Let's do all the other things than just like let it be. Because yeah. I, I like sometimes you need time I, I, as, an, as an artist, I need to look at it a few times mm-hmm. over multiple days with different levels of sleep the night before, you know, to like go, yes. oh, pause here. And then the scene is like, because I've had that happen yeah. where the solution was literally that simple and we were not making space to just have a moment to have that idea. Because we were so like, as you said, like tick tock, tick tock, opening is coming. That anxiety can mm-hmm. be super helpful and also can make you fix things that don't need fixing or the solution is actually much simpler. And I'm sort of very, very, uh, as I sort of continue to try to develop my craft, you know, in this next step of my career, whatever that means, like that's where I'm at. It's like, I'm not going to fix that yet. I'm trying to get better at that. Is- yeah, the solution is usually simple, isn't it? <laughs> it's, yeah. u- it's usually the simpler version. Mm-hmm. But I, I think that's really, really smart. The idea mm-hmm. that, because it goes back to trusting yourself and being mm-hmm. able to say with enough conviction, I got this, that isn't cutting off a conversation or you know, making someone feel like they're not welcome in the process, but also going, l- l- let me do my thing. <laughs> um, well, owning which does what take you need. A lot of, yeah. Owning what you need, right? Like, and this is where, like, if people, as a writer in a new play process, ideally a lot of this, especially in a world premiere, is set up so it can be for you, but it's not always the case, right? right. Where people can feel like their job in a world premiere is to tell you all the things that need to change, right? Right, Ooh, like yes. that. that that's, um, and it's, and that's a big thing for me. Like, I will always start a world premiere production process, like the first director's speech, I'm like, imagine this is perfect, mm-hmm. right? Start from there, especially for actors, because what is going to teach us more is an amazing actor going at it 100% and failing mm-hmm. or asking a question they don't understand is so much more useful than, I think my character would do this right now. Like yeah. it's, you know what I mean? It's just more useful. And similarly for directing, especially if you're interested in the type of directing I am, where I'm not the holder of all answers, right? I'm holder of the space. It's so much more useful if you just let me have a moment. And that, that I set up, I try to set up my processes so I can ask for that. Hmm. The I don't know it, of, I, I don't know yet. Yeah, that's so great. You know? Um, um, yeah. Yeah. As we're kind of aiming towards the hour, mm-hmm. I do oh. want to make space to talk about... Um, your writing and kind of what oh, it is to yeah. be writer, director, adapter, maybe tell us a little bit about the project and mm-hmm. the kind of, I know that it is derailed as all things are for the moment. Postponed, um, hopefully. <laughs> you postponed, know. right. Not derailed, postponed. Um, but yeah, what is, what have you learned in that? What, what, mm-hmm. what is that in your brilliant brain? Yeah, it's, um, it's been a really interesting process as someone who's held space and process for so many different types of writers, all of a sudden putting yourself into that space and almost like knowing too much, like all mm-hmm. the ways in which a writer could work. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it took me a long time and I'm so thankful. It's a co-writing project, uh, Thousand and One Nights a Retelling, which is a commission, uh, which is commissioned by Cal Shakes. Uh, we're creating it was supposed to be an adaptation, but it's really becoming like a new play in response to the original. Oh, that's cool. It, 
yeah, and it and it really weaves in a lot of amazing. Um, it's in parallel with a community storytelling project that Rashma Razvi is leading, and the women, who, Manasa women who take part in that project, are incredibly generous with their stories with us. Um, and in, we thought it could be sort of like docudrama pulled in, but it's turning out to be a much more artistic sort of. Mm. All of these stories coming through me and Layla Buck, who's my co-writer and becoming something and getting woven in. So these modern stories getting woven in the, the play as well. So we've mm -hmm. you know, set up a pretty complicated <laughs> process for ourselves, um, but it's been really interesting like having space to figure out what kind of writer I am and what works for me, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I am a comedic writer that came out pretty strong. Not to say that's the only thing I do, but I, and this makes sense. Like I am, have always been drawn to political joy and comedy as political action. That's mm -hmm. been something I've always been drawn to and my writing voice easily clicks into that. I find like that's where I start and then it deepens from there. So like sort of an absurdism and, you know, like, so something's twisted so that it's funny. Um, is just naturally what comes out of me. Um, but yeah, it's been really interesting to figure that out, figure out when I write and how I write has been really interesting. Mm -hmm. That When is that and how is that? Oh uh, God, um, well, now that I have the OSF job, never is the answer. <laughs> but before that, <laughs> um, I, I'm still trying to figure out how this like huge job interacts with my art making, to be honest. I'm very in the middle of it, um, especially at this moment in time. <laughs> but um, before then, it's actually, I realized that I have to do a ton of thinking hmm. before I write. And then when I write, it comes out complete as a complete scene, right? Like I That's think and think me. and think and think and think. And then I sit and the writing actually in itself isn't that long. Yep. And that first draft isn't great or anything. Like it's not remotely yeah. what it is but it is actually a beginning middle end scene mm -hmm. and then once I have that then I can I'm a very good editor in life in general which is I think why yes. I am drawn to new plays directing um, mm -hmm. so the editing part is actually quite joyous and lovely it's just that like because I have to it has to come out complete for some reason for me it takes a little bit of time to do it yeah. um, it's not surprising that um, co-writing works well for me mm. uh, because I'm used to creating new work in a collaboration. So having someone to bounce ideas off of and, and Layla is a wonderful, generous, open collaborator that has such space for people in her process while being also as just like very clear about like who she is, what she likes and what she doesn't like. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it, we, we made a good, it took us a while. Like it, it, there are ups, there are downs, there are lefts and rights when, as any co-creation process. But I feel like um, we've done a good job of finding each other um, in that process for as far as process goes. And I also- and you're not I think directing I, that either. I am, which oh, is- Oh, you are, okay. Yeah, and it was well, really interesting great. because well, we, we were about question. to go into that. Yes. <laughs> oh, like yeah, we were like about to start that process and I was like, I oh my God, this is going to be really hard. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, and we just, we had a question from uh -huh. Twitter about yes. um, writing and directing your own oh, stuff. And <laughs> and it seems like you were preparing for that. Do you have any I did it once. About... I did it once, once, which was much more of an adaptation of Braggart Soldier, which is a plaudus, ridiculous, like comedy farce thing uh, that I adapted, which I thought was going to be just editing. And then I, it's so sexist, like the original, so funny. Like, I love that play, but it is yeah. so like the sexism of it is so horribly rooted in the middle that yeah. you can't yeah. edit it out. Like you have to rewrite, which I did, uh, but it was like a really difficult process. And what I found with directing my own work for my, for me, because I'm more comfortable as a director than a writer, right? I'm a director becoming a writer and not the other way around. Mm -hmm. My, when I would see a scene, like look at a scene, my assumption was that the writing was the problem always. Mm -hmm. And I had to actually be generous with myself and be like, maybe that's not it. I see. Right, like, like so my solution was like, oh, I'll rewrite that writing. joke. It's not working rather yeah. than being like, oh, the timing is off. 
Interesting. You know, so it, that, because you don't have that other person, you are the other person. So you're having to have the conversation with yourself. Um, there is something like, I don't know, satisfying about like getting to do it. Right? Like you're mm -hmm. like, I own everything, right? Like you're like, <laughs> you know, like I can make all the decisions, right? Like there's something, I'm not going to lie. Uh, it, it was enjoyable <laughs> for my, yeah. you know, uh, for myself, but um, I must say- People I'm, ask if I want to direct and it's, it is, I'm mostly, I'm in awe of great directors, uh -huh. not just because of their vision and um, compassion and control of a room and how you just, all, all of the things, but also like time management, people management, making decisions, all the things. Decisiveness, decision. yeah. Yeah, and like just not, cause it's not people, I don't know what they assume about directors, but it's not coming into a room and be like, here's what we're working on today in, a, in an accent and with a scarf and everything. Yeah. There's so much planning and decision-making mm -hmm. and organizing and that is less my strong suit. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> um, but I do always, I, I don't always want to direct, but when I do want to direct, it is the actor moment. It's the moment stuff. It's the moment mm -hmm. building. It's the crafting of the, as you were saying, the timing of the joke and mm -hmm. the, the exit, like, no, take your time with that exit versus get your ass off the stage kind of an exit. Um, yeah. But it, that's where these relationships, directors, mm -hmm. I think when, when we collaborated well yeah. on Hila was when we were able to kind of go, I could see something and you could see something else and both of them together was like, oh, look at that. That's a full yeah. thing. Perfect. Well, and that one was that. such a, like, I, I must say there is, which for a long time, Thousand and One Nights felt also pretty collage-y. Right. Mm -hmm. Like it was like a multiple ideas because we were trying to bring together so many things into one play. Um, and I, that's something I really get off on. I really get excited yeah, by yeah. creatively. It's very difficult. It's very easy at the beginning and then really difficult at the end. Right. Mm -hmm. to, because at the beginning, it's just like you can put a bunch of stuff you love in it. And it's so easy to keep writing or keep creating. And then you're like, wait, what are we making? Um, <laughs> yeah. And certainly we were like, again, with Thousand and One Nights, that was the that's the period we're in. We're like, wait, this has, this is going to have to come together in yeah. more than just like things are next to each other. And that can be really challenging. But yeah, it's the thing that's really important, I would say, and this is why I love the Thousand and One Nights process is that there is Layla, right? Mm -hmm. Like that there is someone else who's keeping me yeah. honest. There is someone else who's like, I, uh, if you're writing and directing, you need an outside eye that you really trust. In this case, we're both writing. So she's like an inside eye, right? Like yeah. she's, which is even better, uh, but like we're both in it together, um, but we're looking at different things. So even though I'm sort of holding the directorial space too, she can continue to support and question my writing, yep. right? And both of those things are really important till the end, right? Yeah. So that feels super important to me. Um, That's a very that. good practical piece of advice, whether yeah. it's a dramaturg or yeah. just a kind of assistant somebody. director, whatever. Yes. You know, um, associate director, whatever it is, it is a, it's a lot of responsibility in terms of what you're mm -hmm. saying of like the director, like director timetable is one thing and the writer rewriting timetable is one thing and trying to find enough time in the day at the right point that works for your creative juices for both is a puzzle and yeah so that it's not also That's, just like machinery right like because yeah. i'm good at like moving a thing through so i can write yeah. that thing in an hour to fit into the thing we're doing but that's not actually good you know what yeah. i mean it just works and if you want to make a good thing, which I like to think we all do, do it's it. important to have that other person who can support you. And you need a really good stage manager, you know, those things. Yeah, that's really smart. Um, so we're so close to our hour and uh -huh. I wanted to, um, yeah, what, if, if there's any kind of last thoughts, I mean, I feel like I could talk to you forever, partly I know, because right? I want to know like- <laughs> Between the two um, of us. We can just keep going. Um, but I will say that I, I was just looking at um, photos of the Book of Will production at Oregon Shakespeare Festival uh -huh. from a few years ago. They were just emailed to me because of something. Anyway, and just looking at them, I just burst into tears because I miss OSF so much. Aww. And I love that place so much. And I was so excited to see how what you bring to them. And yeah. they are so lucky to have you and Natasha as well. You. 
Um, so I'm excited and we're all thinking of you. I know this is hard for every company out there, but is. OSF is such like a beating heart of this nation's theater scene and ecology that I've, I've been thinking a lot about y'all. So. Oh my God, thank you. Yeah, no, it's, you know, um, it's hard. We're in a very, very hard place. We're not unique in that. Um, you know, the, and it's this really weird cash issue, right? Mm -hmm. Like how much money do you actually have in the bank so that you can get to the point where you're going to start making money again, uh, you know, capitalism. So it's just, um, and that's a different thing than budgeting issue. And that's mm -hmm. been a really interesting process of trying to manage to that, um, which is why I like there's, I like live in Excel sheets and basically, and it's also this really interesting time, which I'm well equipped for, but it's like you make a plan and another plan and another plan, and then you have to make a contingency plan for when none of those plans are taking, you know, because it's such an amorphous, weird, you know, a pandemic is, is just a morphing thing. And you have to be prepared for the 12 options of the 12 options that could happen for every week. And that's mm -hmm. exhausting emotionally because we are, you know, it's hard to plan without committing to the plan. Mm -hmm. It's it's an interesting challenge, but theater people, myself included, we are a hopeful bunch, right? So, you know, I have my moments of like, oh my God, what's gonna happen? And then the next day we somehow think it's gonna be fine, <sighs> right? And you just get out there and do the work. And the thing that uh, Nataki said this in a meeting, um, a couple of days ago with the full com the, the rest of the staff that's uh is with us still um you know like we know how to do this it's never happened before but it is still our work right mm -hmm. and i do feel that way to a certain extent with like even the creative work that's happening right now some of it is great some of it is terrible some of it is like whatever and that's okay that's actually theater mm -hmm. you know like we know how to do this we are like built for keeping yeah. going right yeah, so right. if we can just remember that and take care of each other in that process i actually truly believe we're going to be okay yeah me too you know so that that's and it's there is something really beautiful about this moment that's happening which is you know you're part of this where people who have the means and the ability and the expertise are being generous right you can do a write with me session with susan laurie parks mm -hmm. for free Right, like, and I have this Maybe. feeling that like we will never go back. The sort of elitist, exclusive experience that theater has been built to to serve a very specific population in the American theater, and purposefully excluding others. I think it can't go back to that anymore because we've seen that there's another way, and that it I works. So, so I hope that this horrible thing. That is happening and like let's be honest like theaters are very important but people are dying you know like i'm like yeah. very aware of the luxury of imagining storytelling right now um but like i, I do actually think we're i hope we're going to hold on to some of the joyful access that we've been able to get to here forevermore so that we never not have this conversation where people can log on and talk listen to us talk if they want to you know what i mean that that, that that's possible um you don't have to pay a hundred dollars to do it you yeah. know i think that's exactly right and i think that is out of crisis comes a lot of strange new things and some of the new things are not helpful and some of them have just popped the bubble of something that you don't put the bubble back together it's out now and isn't that a great thing that much yeah. like you i've taken such incredible comfort with theaters across the world that i would have never seen um and right? i get to feel a part of i feel it's a global community really because we are now and i yeah exactly the, the, uh, the single thing can touch all of us we thought yes. that was not possible and it is yeah. so now we have and to live course, like it is yes you know? that's right and, and it's just the thing is and i'm i take great comfort that there's been a lot of talk about, you know, this is my first year at OSF and I'm associate obviously, but like um, Hannah Sharif and St Stephanie Barra, you know, the, all, mm -hmm. all of these Nataki at OSF, um, these incredible new leaders are in place. And there is a little sadness that this is the thing they have to deal with in their first year, but I'm like yeah. so fucking glad that it's them. 
You know yeah, what I mean? Right? This next generation of leaders who are coming from different types of experiences so that they can have a different perspective on what's possible, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think the theaters that are not gonna make it are the ones that deceive themselves <laughs> into believing that there's a going back to the, the what used to be. Right. If you way. actually are trying to just hold on so that you can do exactly what you did before, I think those are the theaters that are in trouble. But these theaters that are being led by actual visionaries who are coming from different kind of experiences, who see this moment as a possibility, mm -hmm. I think those are the theaters that could really thrive and jumpstart something. Yeah. That's my hope. Oh, I think let's jumpstart it. Right? Jumping it's time. And oh, it was time anyway. It. It was Let's time. It was, it's been time. Like we've been talking about how American theater is broken for like, what, two decades? Yeah. Let's fix it. Let's fix it. The cat, the cat agrees. I love it. Um, thank you so much. Everyone. Oh my God. This thank you for inviting. Gift. It feels so You're nice to feel like an artist for like, you know, this hour where oh. I get to talk art with this, another talk smart art. artist. Um, I think I think that's one thing we can always do. Can't always make as much theater in the same ways, but we can talk about it forevermore. So thank you for being such for all that you do and for sharing this wisdom with us. And uh, I'll I, check it was in a, it was an absolute and... joy. Thank you for having well, me. Well, good. Yes, awesome. All right, bye everybody. Thanks so much. Bye everyone. I'll check questions in the comments, and maybe I'll if everyone has a second, we'll throw him one of the questions.